Okay, the, I really wanted to um, emphasize fun in, in climate change at a, um, mitigation. I think it's something that it absolutely can be filled with a lot of fun activities, but it, it comes across, you know, all the words that people use are, you know, doom and gloom and responsibility and morals. And, um, you know, it's, it, I think that really kind of puts some people off and I think it really, um, it really paralyzes some people and it keeps them from doing things they might otherwise do. So let's see if this is working. Just not. Oh. <laughs> yeah. So the we're talking about net zero today, which Steve, uh, my co-presenter, is going to talk more details about what exactly that means. But um, I, I, the, I do want to point out that it is not a destination. It's not something like, oh my God, I'm so far away from there. I'll never make it, and then you never get to the point where you say, yay, I'm done, I'm there. Um, everybody has something that they can do to, to move somewhere along the path, and it's, you know, the path is really the point. The, you know, being in tune with the earth and living with the earth rather than taking advantage of the earth. So next slide. It's not an amplifying mic, yeah, sorry. Can you hear me? Is that Okay, sorry. Um, so this kind of reemphasizes that point that there are, uh, you could take big steps, you could take tiny steps, but the important thing is that you're on the path and you're moving forward. Um, I, I know a lot of people don't want to come to something like this because they say, oh, I've already done that. You know, I, I already know all that stuff. I don't, but I think even people with straw bale houses and windmills and goats, and I apologize if any of you have any, all those things, but, um, you know, th there's something that everyone can do to take a step along the path. So the question is, what can you do today? That's the easiest way to focus is, what can I start doing now? You know, it's, it's daunting to look way in the future and say, oh my God, I have so much to do. But what can you do now and what's holding you back? Next slide, please. So before we get into that, and I'll, I'll introduce Steve, um, I want to talk about what, what's holding a lot of people back. I think that a lot of people really are not tuning into this discussion because, um, because they feel guilty about it. They, hear, they see all the things that some people are doing and they're really impressive and they, I could never possibly do that. And I, um, you know, yes, I drive my car to work. And, um, you know, it's so easy to, to disengage because you, it, um, it reminds you of all the things that you're not doing. Um, so, you know, it doesn't sound like fun. And I think it's important that it, that it does sound like fun because it can be. But, you know, I would much rather be outside on a beautiful, beautiful Saturday afternoon than be at a conference talking about my moral responsibilities. Um, <laughs> so, next slide. I think that, you know, that's one of the advantages to speaking to a faith uh, community is that, um, the concept of forgiveness. And I think that in order to move forward, we need to forgive ourselves. And, and we need to be forgiven for, for not doing all we can, for doing things that are detrimental. Um, and I was, I, I'm a Lutheran and um, confession and absolution, forgiveness is you know, right there in our DNA. And I, um, I was a little concerned, you know, that this isn't just a Lutheran or a Christian group, but I, I did a little Googling, and I think that, um, you know, the idea of, of being aligned with God is present in all faiths, and the, you know, uncomfortable feeling when you're not aligned with God, um, and I think we, ha we all have a need for confession, repentance, and forgiveness. So, next slide. So, um, so we do need to acknowledge our contributions the, to the um, to the state of the world right now. You know, it was stated before that it's, um, you know, it's definitely fossil fuel companies are not making it easy for us, but there are things that we are doing that are not helping and there are things that we're doing that are not um, really getting the ball moving. So we've done damage uh, to have a comfortable lifestyle. We haven't done the things to protect the planet because we didn't, we didn't want to, we didn't have time for it. Um, 
we couldn't afford it. We didn't have the courage to do it because it would have been uh, politically embarrassing. And the things that we've allowed to go on way too long. I think that we all, you know, I think really recognize that there's so much to do that, and we haven't done it. And, you know, we need to acknowledge that and move forward. So next slide. So I, what I want to do is I want to go through, and th this is, again, part of my Lutheran tradition of uh, confession and uh, forgiveness. So I, but I th again, I think it's universal. I want to start now by um, having us, you know, look inside and, and confess some of the things that you have done or things that you have not done um, that have not helped the world. Um, and if you would be willing to share some of those, that would be great. Uh, if you want to just ponder it in your heart, that would be great too. But let's have just a moment of confession for the things that we have done or left undone. And I want to say I don't ride my bike to work even though I could. I could very easily ride my bike to work and I don't, and I feel bad about that. So anyone else that has anything to... Yeah, she goes on cruises even though she knows that the um, that it's very polluting. Shirley, did you? I'm oh, sorry. Oh, um, Helen, the bike. The bike. Okay. Single occupancy vehicle on the road. That. Enjoys going long distances in fossil fuel vehicles. Pampers, oh my God. <laughs> There's someone over there? <laughs> Mom? <laughs> oh no. Get that off your, get that off your chest, that's great. <laughs> Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is there anyone else that has something they want to get off their chests? In your hearts or verbally. So next slide. Um, so I would say that, you know, it, again, according to my Lutheran tradition at least, we don't deserve this gift that has been given to us. Yeah, there's nothing that we can do that would be so wonderful that we would deserve uh, such a beautiful um, garden that has been planted for us. But next slide. But fortunately, um, again, part of our tra faith tradition, God loves us and God does not want us to suffer. God is merciful and wants our lives aligned even more than we do. So even though we don't deserve it, God has mercy and forgives each and every one of us for all of our excesses and weaknesses. So, next slide. Um, so you are hereby forgiven. Everyone here, if, I don't know if I have the authority to do that, but to the extent that I am authorized, I am doing that. Um, and so we're redeemed, the slate is wiped clean, and we are born anew. And I had to have some pictures of my family there just kind of showing, you know, new life, kind of. Um, so we can move forward. You know, we, we've removed the blocks from our, our shoulders. We can move forward and rededicate ourselves to uh, rebuilding the planet, healing the planet. And this is something that I think we need to do every day. You know, when you get up in the morning, say, you know, oh, yesterday I didn't ride my bike again. Um, and I feel really bad about that, but I'm forgiven and I'm moving forward. So maybe I'm going to ride my bike today. You never know. It could happen. Um, next slide. So you are hereby forgiven. This one has some animation. So, <laughs> so let's get a move on. There's lots of stuff to do. There's, um, there's all kinds of things. These are all pictures from my church, LCI, um, of people having fun doing environmentally related things. And I want to just tell a short story of, um, I read an article that was saying that people feel like they have no time anymore. And that if you look at the data, though, that people, you know, have kind of the same amount of time that they've had in the past. I don't know if that's quite true. But the, um, but that the things that they do in their leisure time, 
the involvement with our community and so forth, feels a lot more like work than it used to. You know, in your free time, you're the mayor of Davis, or you're the, um, you know, you're on a, a committee, or you're, you know, you're, you're doing some data processing for some, for Cool Davis, or, you know, a lot of, so I really want to encourage people to think about things that you can do with a group, things that you can do, um, you know, that, that really maybe are outside your, your professional careers, you know, things like cleaning up Highway 13. I, I know my mom has done that. I think others, um, you know, there, there's a lot of things to do out there, and especially when you do it with a group, it can be fun. So one more. So let's have some fun. One thing I want to say before we move on, upper right-hand corner is, I think, the queen of having fun. Um, a lot of you knew Dina Biscotti was a, a, real, um, a real champion of, of efficiency and responsibility for the planet, but also a, a very big proponent of fun. So, um, and, and she died uh, last year, so um, we all really miss her. She would be here today if, if she were here, and, and I know she would be having some fun too. So um, with that, I think I can hand it over to Steve. Introducing Steve Nyholm. Thanks, Kristen. Mm -hmm. Hey, everybody, and thank you for Kristen for that uh, that wonderful lead into our workshop. And um, really, uh, really excited to work with you on this project and uh, getting to know uh, the important work that you do. It's really valuable. Uh, can everybody hear me in the back? I'm trying to project. It's yeah, good enough. Okay, um, so I'm going to start off. I'm actually going to break from our presentation. It's my desktop, my computer, and that's a picture of um, myself, my wife, and our two girls. Uh, that was this summer. Right now, they're, they're two. And, excuse me a second. I'm going to have a human moment right now. Two and four and a half. Um, it, it makes me cry, honestly. Um, the stuff that Kathleen Dean Moore was saying about the children growing up and um, you know the possibility of a bleak future. I know this is a fun talk, but making it fun, but this is, I thought, bringing some, some real human life to it would be good too. Um, and it, the thought of like what she said of the ocean levels rising and people from the cities like coming out here and you know, the angry mobs and people like, maybe we can't grow here food in California anymore, so do we need to migrate north to Oregon? And what are they gonna do when we show up? And is that the world that, that my girls are going to have to live in? It just, it breaks me down every day. I think about it every day. And I'm always thinking about what can I do? What can our community do? What can our society do to, to change that trajectory so that our children don't have to go through that or to prepare them if it does? So um, let's go on to the next slide, and I'll try to bring more fun into it. <laughs> Oops, that's backwards. OK, so uh, we have a few examples of places in town where people have made very significant strides towards uh, the goal of reducing our impact. On, on the planet. So go ahead and go to the next slide. And uh, so this is the home of Alan Pryor, um, leader of Sierra Club. And he's done a lot of really amazing things. He, he got solar on his house and um, solar hot water heaters. So all of his hot, I think all of his hot water, I know that all of his electricity um, comes from the solar. Um, and then he, he started reducing his consumption and he reduced it down to the point where he was giving a lot back to PG&E, so he said, I don't want to do that. Let me get an electric car, and then I'll start getting my, my transportation off the grid, too. So he got a car, and um, so you can see some of these pictures here. He has um, extensive gardening. He grows a lot of his own food, um, so he's, he's reducing um, his impact on the agriculture system that way, and he has some zero scaping in the front um, to help, you know, the water and the drought and everybody. I don't have to say much more about water. We're all pretty scared of that. Um, and a whole house fan is a really effective thing to do. 
Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, I have some friends who live in village homes, and in their house, I was blown away because I went to visit them, and it was in the summer, and it was a really hot day, but it was cool inside their house. And they, they don't use an air conditioner. They don't use coolers. They don't use an air conditioner. They don't do anything. Their house was built to um, use passive energies, and it was designed from the ground up to be able to do that. They don't use air conditioner. They use limited heater in the winter time. Sometimes they, they confess they use a space heater in one room if they need to. Other than that, that's it. Uh, no, he said they run it one day a year to make sure that it isn't broken. And that's it. And uh, I thought it was really amazing. And how do they do it? It's uh, southern orientation, capturing the, the winter south sun because it comes in on a different angle. Um, they have the, the big, huge water tanks. They're like big metal culverts, 15 feet tall. And uh, that thermal mass captures the solar um, solar heat gain, and um, they have thicker walls. They have a greenhouse on that side of the house. So they can just open the window where the greenhouse is and let some of the greenhouse heat come in the house. And, um, and they said that actually it works in reverse in the summertime, too. The greenhouse is a trickier thing in the summer. That's a long topic. I won't go into that. Um, but it's, I was amazed. They know, like, for us, our, our energy, our home energy use is the HVAC, heater and air conditioner. And if we could get off of those, we would be net zero with like one panel, one solar panel. It's, it's, that's a big one. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, Parkview Place, I just um, got aware of this recently. It's uh, kind of across the street from Farmer's Market, and it was a um, community, I'm probably going to describe it wrong, kind of a cooperative community for uh, seniors in town. A bunch of people got together, and they had a goal of making it net zero energy. And net zero energy, if somebody doesn't know what that means, that means that the energy that you produce on site is more than the energy you use on site. So they're, they're electric, they produce more. The goal was to produce more than they use. And um, they also use some passive solar techniques and some active solar techniques. Um, of course, lighting, like LED lights and things like that, too. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Here's a. They have a really nice, they have a website about their, their place, and they have a, this, this uh, diagram online, and it talks about the systems they're using with the, the PV, photovoltaics, electric, um, night sky cooling, solar thermal, uh, radiant floors is another uh, really valuable technique, um, heat pumps. Let's go ahead and go to the next one. Um, and then a lot of people know about Indigo Architecture. They, they just uh, rebuilt the Dairy Queen and uh, made it uh, much more energy efficient. And those are, you're looking at straw bale walls right there. And um, they, they did put uh, radiant heating and cooling uh, in the floors. Lots of, lots of tubes that go through the floors. It's concrete floors so that there's a lot of, of mass to hold the heat and the cool. And keep, it just, it'll keep the temperature stable in there. So that's, that's a, another great local example of um, people taking action towards these goals. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And, uh, and this is our house. This is the Marino and Nyholm house. And um, we're, we're in progress. I like to say that we're all in transition. And um, for this house, we're, we're looking at how can we, how can we um, heat our house and cool our house and create electricity and heat our water? And um, where does our water come from? How can we save water? Where does our food come from? How can we grow food at our place and all of our waste? Where does our waste go? And let's compost as much of that as we can and, and repurpose things that we can't. Um, so this is it's a, a full uh, permaculture system. Um, permaculture is a kind of a design approach to to look at what, are, what does it cost in terms of inputs to live our lifestyle and, um, and also where does our stuff go when we're done with it and how do we reduce our impact. Um, so let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So now there's, um, I, I brought, not everybody can see, but I have a lot of stuff scattered around the floor here and I brought a bunch of things I could just hands on show you how a bunch of things work and I wanted to show easy and cheap things to do. So my goal is, I think everything up here is under $30 per item. So these are things that most people could do. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'll start with energy, electricity, and natural gas. Um, the first one's called a kilowatt. So I have one right here. And um, 
I bought this down at Ace, and if you buy one, actually, I would recommend you get one from um, probably online, because there's another model where you can plug it in, and it has a cord that goes off of it. I was running around the house testing with it this week, and it was really hard to read. So what, what does this do? Um, this, you plug it into the wall here, and then you plug something else into it here, and it tells you how many watts that thing uses. So it's a really quick and easy way to measure. Yeah, I was telling you about that last night. Um, so this is a way, if you want to know, like, my lamp, how much electricity does this use? And you plug it in, and then you know how much does it use. And um, I have, after we're done talking, I have a, a plug here, and we can, if you want to, we can plug stuff in and, and try it out. It's kind of fun. Um, so I plugged in these two light bulbs. This one's a 60 watt incandescent, and guess what? It used 60 watts an hour. <laughs> that was pretty cool. It, it matched the number, and um, the, the measuring thing said it was right. And, and then this one is an LED bulb for the same kind of 60 watt output. And for this one, it, this says 9.5 watts, but it was 8.9. It was pretty close. So that, that, was, that was a big difference. Um, and then there's a math problem of like, how many watts per hour, how many watts in a kilowatt, and then you look at your bill and you're billed by the kilowatts, and then you can see an impact on you know, your, your PG&E bill or whatever and how many, uh, what the impact is on your life. And it's, it's pretty easy math to do. I went over it super fast, but it is pretty simple. Um, here's another one that's pretty fun. And it's, I went around the house with this. It's an infrared gun, and it measures temperature. And so you just like point it at something, and it'll tell you what the temperature is on the thing that it's, it's looking at. So in the summer, I went in our house, and it was like 80 degrees here. And I went on the west side of our house, and everything was 80. And I went to the west side. The west wall was 85 degrees. And the whole rest of the house was 80. I thought, what's going on? So then I went outside, and it, it was uh, over 100 degrees. And I tested it, and like the ground outside said it was 100. So that looked pretty good. So again, like the number matched up. It's the tools working. Um, and then I went around to the side of the house, that west side, that was in the afternoon, and the sun was beating down on the house. And the outside of the wall was 140 degrees. <laughs> yeah, it was really hot. Uh, it's white. It's reflective. Yeah, and I mean, it's just straight on sunlight in the summertime. And then I went, I, I crawled underneath the house and I poked it down there. It was 65. It felt like I was in an air conditioner. It was great. So it's, this is kind of a fun tool, you know, to find out in your house, like, where do you have a leak or where, which rooms have problems? It helped us figure out our bedroom is always the hottest room in the house because it's the one that's getting the sun shining on it. And then that's something we can fix. Now we know what the problem is. I'm a really big believer in, um, you know, look at what's happening around you, observe it and measure it and figure it out. And when you see it, and when you see what the problem is, then, you, then you, the solution kind of becomes obvious. Let's go ahead and go to that. Oh, let's see. Um, yeah. Watt meters are available for checkout at the library, and Cool Davis is going to be purchasing some of these Ooh. for checkout at the library. Oh, that's awesome. Yay, Cool Davis. <laughs> What's that? OK. Um, so Chris Granger just said that Cool Davis is buying some of the infrared um, heat measuring devices. And they're going to have those in the library for checkout. And there's also the uh, kilowatt style electricity measuring devices at the library for checkout. Yeah. Um, so just really quickly on my slide here, clotheslines are a great cheap way to go. Um, get off your dryer in the summertime. My clothes will dry in an hour outside because it's so hot and so the sun's baking it. Solar cookers, um, we're actually going to be kicking off a solar cooking club in April 11th. So um, how about not cooking all summer long and you have, or not using your stove, not heating your house with it, and use solar cookers? Um, and let's just go ahead and move on because I think I have way more stuff to talk about than I have time. Oh, sure. Uh, leasing solar panels, that's something that we did, so I can speak from my experience. And we actually ended up that we're, there's no money down, so that's, that falls in this cheap, and it's not easy. It's kind of a, a bit of negotiating and permitting hassle, but um, it's, it's cheap because there's no money down, and it's a lease where it's a 20-year lease, and we pay a fixed amount to the solar company, and they guarantee the output of our panels. And that just reduced our load on the system tremendously. Um, our place, 
our peak year in 2010, we were over 10,000 kilowatt hours with, that we um, paid PG&E for. And last year, our true up came up. That's a, every 12 months, PG&E says, you have solar panels, and let's see how you did with it. Do you owe us money? Do we, do we owe you money? And we had used, we went from 10,000 a few years ago to 172 last year. So we're not net zero because we still used 172 kilowatt hours above, which is really a small amount. Um, yeah, we, we basically hit it. So it's having solar panels also made us more aware of um, the time of day we we're using electricity and the things we we're doing. And it was like this competition, like, hey, can we, can we get net zero? What if we stop doing this? What if we stop using the dryer and dry all our clothes outside? And we started doing all these things and, and seeing the meter run negative, that is really fun. <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah, another question in the back. Yeah, there are HOAs that actually will forbid you from uh, drying clothes outside. I actually ran into that when I lived in, when I moved up here in Sacramento. Oh, wow. Clothes outside of the line, and they got a letter saying, stop doing that. Wow. Right. Any in Davis? No, there was no sacrifice. There was. There was. Yeah. I think they've been removed, but there was when I first moved here. Huh. And there's all there were also um prohibitions against having outside window air conditioning. That's right. I don't think that has been removed. I'm not sure. I think West Village doesn't allow um closed line drying. Hmm. Very strange. I think the thing is it can't be visible from the street. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, those retractable lines in my garage. Yeah, retractable lines. Awesome. So for the microphone, the comment was that um, there are some HOAs that don't allow uh, clothesline drying outside, uh, but the conversation seemed to gravitate towards maybe not in Davis, but um, there were, certainly was one in Sacramento. If, if there are some of those, that's an institu institutional barrier, and um, you know, let's try to come together, together as a community to try to um, address those those issues and make those changes. Um, I noticed that for our workshop, we were going to have an interactive part of about half an hour, and that would mean my time is up now. And I had four other areas to cover, so maybe I'll just say the topics and uh, very briefly say some of the, the toys I brought with me. And if you have more questions about it, I'd be really happy to, to show, my, show off my stuff um, a little bit later on. So for water, water is such a big issue. Um, for us, like a success point, just to kind of share, like that's possible. For a family of four, we got um, we were probably like 160 to 250 gallons a month, um, not counting um, ir outside irrigation, um, before we became aware. And we worked really hard at it, and we got down to our our best month, which was like three months ago. Uh, we got down to 50 gallons for a month, or 50 gallons a day. Was our was our monthly figure, uh, so we're really proud of that, and it was a lot of work. And here's uh, a bunch of the things we did. Uh, so went around with um, measuring jugs, like an empty milk jug, and measured the flow rates. And we put buckets in the shower to reuse the water. Um, learned how to wash dishes in ways that are more water efficient than dishwashers. Um, you have to be careful because if you do it the wrong way, it's way worse than a dishwasher. And um, change the aerators or the sinks. Um, things like take less showers and use a washcloth instead. Um, that's a really big difference. Shorter showers and maybe like have a timer in your shower. That was a fun competition of like how, how many seconds can I do a shower in? I, you know, my personal best is like two minutes and 15 seconds. And I don't have hair. <laughs> um, a question in the back. Yeah. <laughs> Another comment. Share, uh, sells a little device that has on it a little button that if you press the button, it just turns off the water. Mm. You put it back on and it turns it on again. So you can 
soap up and while it's off. And Awesome. For the microphone, there's some uh, shower watering conservation tips in the audience. Uh, let's go ahead and go on to the next topic. Uh, for food, um, I've got to share this one because I think it's really cute. Uh, it's, a, it's a pot that I made out of newspaper. I folded it up kind of like origami. And then um, I have compost inside of here that I added some uh, decomposed leaves to it as well. So it made a potting soil. And, and we're using this to start our seeds this year. So it's like really, really low impact. Um, Growing food personally, passionately, I think that that's a huge thing that we all should be doing. And um, it's reduced our carbon footprint and also doesn't contribute to um, soil degradation and pollution and other issues that come up with larger agriculture. Um, I should probably stop there because I could go on and that for a couple hours. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the next, the next slide. Uh, for waste, composting for me is a huge one, um, a fun one. Here's a, a zero waste party kit that I have, and it's just a cloth bag. And inside of here, I have like some plastic plates from garage sale and some knives and forks and stuff from a garage sale, a kid's cup. Um, kids' napkins are great because they're cloth and you can wash them. And, and so I'll take these to a party, and then when I'm done, I just bring some old bucket and have everybody throw all the food and plates and everything in the bucket take it home and it's not that much work to wash it and then that that party is generated um, no no dishes waste and no food waste so that was a really simple and easy one to do here's another one that's really a lot of people don't know about a plastic bottle and there are, it takes resources to recycle plastic and um, one thing you can do, it's good to recycle and recycling, totally a proponent of that. Another thing you can do is you can make what's called a bottle brick, and that's where you stuff it full of the plastic stuff like this that doesn't recycle, and you just jam it in there and you jam it in there, and if you get enough of it in there, it gets hard like a brick, and you can use it for a building material, and people do. So um, that's a little known thing that we could do, and not everybody out here is gonna go build a cob bench or a cob house and need these. Um, but that's, it's something to think about, like trying to help you think of d new ideas. Compassion, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's, there's a bench in, in Davis that's uh, the Compassion Bench. It's right across from uh, Burgers and Brew and across from Crepeville, right next to, right across from the, the uh, Central Park where the Farmer's Market is. And that was made using this technology. So let's go ahead and go to the next one. And uh, transportation. I could just sum it down to like drive slower and ride a bike. Um, had, we, we got a Prius and the, it told us how many miles per gallon and I realized the slower I drove, the better, more efficient I was. So it's like, all right, let off the, the gas and the brakes and that helped. Um, and then just, you know, figure out ways to bike and, and make it practical for life. Yeah, um, that's, my, that's my stuff. Oh, um, I also have a bunch of interesting documents I'd be happy to share if somebody wants to hear more about them. Um, we have six years of gas and electric usage data that I have in a spreadsheet. It's kind of fun to look at if you're into that kind of thing. Um, our true up build I was telling you about, I brought, um, that's on the computer, um, a tool that I made in a spreadsheet for how to estimate how much water your yard needs. And if you do techniques like catching rainwater off your roof or catching it in earthworks or gray watering and what impact that has on your watering. Um, there's ways to quantify it. Um, a harvest calendar is neat because it's uh, looking at what, what food you're growing at home and what months you harvest it and you could actually have food all year grown here. Um, and then gasoline spending data. And then also this is really big is how much money can you save from switching to a net zero lifestyle and going off of these systems you can have some substantial savings. Yeah, so I'll switch to clicking the slides. The next part's Kristen's part. Okay, we're gonna go through a little exercise now where everybody here is gonna develop a plan for your net zero lifestyle. Um, yeah, 
Okay, I'm, what we're going to do now is a sort of an interactive exercise where we're all going to work on developing our own uh, net zero living plan or you know, the, the pathway that we're going to take to, um, to, to increase our, or to decrease our impact on the planet. Um, I, in the interest of time, I'm going to focus um, on, oh, let me do this. So the first thing you want to do is you want to say, where am I? You know, what have I done already? What, you know, pat yourselves on the back and feel good about some of the things that you've spent some time on. So what I want you to do is, um, if there are some pencils coming around, so hopefully people have a, a green handout and some pencils. And the, the second and third pages of this handout are a list of things that you might do. And they are, is taken very, uh, pretty directly from the Cool Davis checklist that Chris mentioned earlier. Although it's, um, I, I have changed things a little bit. But what I want everyone to do is kind of go through this list a little bit, and maybe we can have the lights back on, back up. Or do you know how to? Oh, okay. Um, does everyone have a pencil? Does everyone have a pencil? Where's the box? Okay, so mark off, you know, look through the list a little bit and mark off some of the things that you've, you've already done. Does everyone have pencils now? So I don't think we're going to have time to completely go through this whole exercise, but let's, you know, at least get a start on, on some of these things. Um, what I want you to do now is... On the first page, there's a, a description of some categories that some of these, these actions might fall into. And so I want you to, um, you know, when you go home, maybe you know, do this more thoroughly, but take a look at, at the list and mark off at least one thing you know, that looks fun. You write the word fun in the uh, interest in opportunity category. And of course, you can have more than one um, uh, in each category. So, you know, if you just kind of go through this and, you know, I think, you know, skateboarding and roller skates, that sounds fun. <laughs> I think it might kill me, but it sounds fun. Um, so, you know, just go through and, and identify those. Which ones look easy? No brainers. Let's figure out some of those. Uh, which ones sound social? Like I was saying before that if you do things with other people, it makes it much, much more fun. Um, you know, is there something that you could get together with a neighbor and you could do it together? Or you could have a little competition with your neighbor, maybe. Um, maybe you've done something already and you can tell your neighbors about it or tell other people in Davis, write a letter to the editor of the Enterprise or, um, you know, learn for, get, take something from your experience and share it with other people. Um, your neighbor, which, so what's something that one of your neighbors has done that you've kind of been curious about maybe? Um, wondering, you know, how hard is that? You know, what, what was involved in doing it? How, how well has it worked out? You know, go and talk to your neighbor about that. Uh, what's the thing that you feel the most guilty about not doing? Let's put that on the list. I mean, we'll, if, if it's going to stress you out, though, don't put it on the list. Um, but something that, you know, you think if you do it, it might actually make you feel better. Which one do you think telling, pe telling your mother about would make her proud of you? And my mother is right here, so I can 
We'll talk later. <laughs> What's one thing that will get your, your Uncle Rodney, who's a climate denier, really irritated when you tell him all about your, your vermiculture and your... Um, <laughs> Uh, which is the one that, that you think all your neighbors are going to really admire you if they see that you're doing it? Or your co-workers, or your, your kids, friends, parents, or, um, you know, which one do you think would give you a, a feeling of, of, yes, I've accomplished something that you have not? Um, which ones that sound like a challenge that you might be up to? Maybe you're not, but... You know, it, it sounds like something that you could maybe, you know, it's a little intimidating, but it's something that maybe you could, you would feel really good about yourself if you, if you accomplished that. What's something that maybe sounds daunting, but you can try it at least once? You know, you don't have to commit to doing it forever, but is there something that um, you could try once? Skateboarding? Something like that. Uh, maybe mark one that looks like it would be quite expensive, but it meets some of your other criteria. So it might be worth looking into ways of financing or um, you know, looking at the, um, the benefits that you'll get from energy savings and so forth and see if that might offset the expense. Um, you know, if, they, if they meet your other criteria, they're fun, they make your mother proud and so forth, so, uh, they might be, it might be worth doing. And then finally, uh, ones that sound hard, but they meet your other criteria, so um, you should maybe look at it and see if it's something that you could do. So when you get home, you know, go through this list in a little bit more detail and, and you know, mark off all the ones that, um, that fall in these categories. And then what I want you to do is the ones that have codes next to them, you know, I, I think for a lot of people, something just jumps off the page at you, and you say, wow, I, I never thought about that. But yeah, that would, that would p tick off my Uncle Rodney. Um, <laughs> the, um, you know, things that you might not have thought about, but something that, that kind of jumps out at you and says, yeah, maybe I could do that. Maybe pick th I, three of them. And then for each one of those, what is something that you could do tomorrow? Not, you know, next summer or next winter, but... Is there something you could do tomorrow? Maybe starting to look into what, you know, what's a good efficiency for a refrigerator, or um, you know, starting to learn something, or uh, ask, you know, writing off for some information about something, or going to the the appliance store, researching it. You know, what is something that you can do tomorrow? And then finally, uh, can you pledge to do that tomorrow? Anyone have anything that they put on their list of, of things that they can do tomorrow that they can pledge to do? What's that? Light a light timer. Great. So we've got a light, uh, light timer and smart strips for appliances. Anyone else have anything that they're... LED bulbs. <laughs> LED bulbs. Gonna go to the hardware store tomorrow? Today, all right. Pardon me? You're going to replace your toilet tomorrow? That's awesome. All right. And then um, I, I want you to, you know, if you're so inspired, put these things up on your refrigerator. Check them off when you do them. You'll feel good about seeing all those things checked off. And, and I would say once you've done some things, Go back and look at the list and pick some more that you think that you can do right away. And I think you'll find, you know, I think Steve is a, uh, a great example that, um, you know, if, you, if we're forcing people to do this and they really don't want to do it, it's probably going to be really hard. But if you're excited about this stuff and you're kind of an energy geek like I think we are, and some of you may be, um, you know, this stuff can be really fun and, and it can be a challenge that you, that you really want to take. You know, I, for me, it's, it's getting through the, the day in the summer without turning on my air conditioner. Like, you know, how long can I go and how, is it cool outside yet? No, it's not. But um, so, you know, making little challenges for yourself actually can be, 
you know, if it's something you're interested in, it's not a burden, it's fun. Um, so, and you will never know that until you try. So I, I want to thank everyone for being here, and I really want to encourage you to, to fill this out and put it on your refrigerator. Who's going to put it on their refrigerator? All right, cool. And I have, a, uh, on the front here, I, have, I put my email address, and I hope Steve doesn't mind, I put his email address. <laughs> Let us know how it's going. Let us know if you've done something to follow up. On, on some of these ideas. I think um, it'd be great to share some of these stories. So. Yeah, so I have a question for the group. Joe might know because he brought this up. Uh, I don't use my car much, and I'm thinking of just not having a car. Do people know how well Lyft and Uber live? Work in Davis, if they come right away? How well what? Lyft and Uber. Do they even exist here? Yeah. There was a question that, uh, Someone is interested in getting rid of his car, and he wants to know if, if some of the alternatives are reliable. Um, Uber is, works. Great. So there's another workshop that's going to have some more information. Um, there was a thought that Uber is more Sacramento-based and might not be as reliable in Davis. So there's some efforts underway to, to look at a holistic way at the transportation needs of the community, including things like Uber and Lyft. Jim, did you? Well, I have a question. Uh, we have solar panels, and so we, uh, because of the time of use thing, we don't pay any money to pg and &E, but we're still using electricity. And if we put more panels on so that we don't use electricity, we're subsidizing pg and &E. um, what, what is the prospect of getting the, the was it net metering or whatever, so that we get reimbursed for generating electricity? It's a, it's a difficult policy question because the utilities, you know, they've invested a lot in the, in the running wires to your house and the transformers to serve it and the generators. So on that one hot day when, you, when you're, maybe your solar's not working that day and so you do need, you know, to fire up all your air conditioners, everything has to be in place for that one hour. Um, it, you know, I, I agree with you. It seems it seems crazy to um, to have to do that. But I think another thing to look at is um, there are policies that are asking utilities to use more um, renewable energy to, to generate the electricity. So um, I think I, Joe, do you know anything about the policies? Um, if you produce more than you use, PG&E now does pay you back. But it, you have to generate more kilowatt hours than you use, so it's not zero net cost, it's zero net energy. But they only pay you back at four cents a kilowatt hour, which is a quarter maybe of what you're actually paying. So they're being very resistant to doing it. Um, so I think, you know, if you go solar, you're, you're doing it for the good of the environment. Um, and there should be better public policy. If, if the city goes community choice aggregation, would that solve? The that is that is the reason for everybody in this room to be behind community choice aggregation, or <laughs> Davis Municipal Utility District, uh, or community solar, no. which is the idea that we would all aggregate our money and put together a big solar panel outside of town that we would all be able to access <laughs> on our roads. There were. Let me just say for the recording that there were. Um, comments made that there are um, there are some things in the works in Davis looking at a municipal utility or a community solar facility or um, I forget what the first one was but that choice, choice aggregation yeah that will um, that will allow us to come up with more equitable and more maybe reasonable rules for how all, all this happens so that we can get the most savings uh, possible Chris you want and in the meantime do some community building and share with your neighbors and because they'll start to learn what you're saving and what your access is doing. Um, Alan Pryor, if you know him, is a great example of this. He's 
over the last several years has done a lot of sharing, especially with neighbors who lost a job and needed extra supplement, you know, with that extra supplement to their income by covering a little part of their electric hmm. And w one thing I want to say is I'm a, um, I work for the university. I'm part of the energy cluster that, uh, that Joe works with. And I, uh, I've seen some studies that show that the number one thing that correlates with people installing solar is if they have a neighbor that has installed solar. Um, so, you know, number one, talk to your neighbors, see, see what their experience is like. And number two, if you have solar, talk to your neighbors and tell them how great it is. And, um, you know, help them get over the hump to actually do something. Club, Sierra Club has a program where uh, through, through a, a particular vendor, um, if you put in solar with that vendor, then you get a $750 rebate. They guarantee that you'll save money, and Sierra Club itself gets a $750. Uh, and that's been a, a big help in terms of our being able to work on other environmental okay. Great. So a comment was made that the Sierra Club has a, a program where you will get money back f from participating vendors of solar systems, and money actually also goes to the, the Sierra Club. That's great. I don't know if we need to wrap up. Um, I don't see anyone breathing down our necks, but um, what time is this session supposed to be over? At 2? Oh, the next one starts at 2? OK. Um, I, any, maybe one last question or comment? Uh, I think there's a big problem with you know, solar uh, when people uh, live in rental apartments, single family homes that are rented, you know, the owners don't necessarily want to make those sorts of investments even though mm -hmm. Yeah. Since, you that? That since these are all uh, commercial properties, mm -hmm. maybe there could be some sort of, uh, you know, when they renew their, their license each year, mm -hmm. some sort of an incentive or a requirement Mm -hmm. The comment was made that it's uh, the idea of putting in solar is more difficult in rental housing, um, that the owner doesn't have a lot of motivation to do that, and maybe there's some policy um, motivators that we can have to, to encourage that. Um, it's also, I know the people that have done it, it's, it's sometimes difficult figuring out who pays what and the you know, exactly how it works um, contractually and things like that can be kind of complicated, but it's, I think it's something that's gonna happen a lot more in the future and it's worth figuring out um, how, how we can do it. You know, I'm sure that's gonna be part of the um, Davis's, you know, net zero um, planning to, to look at things like that. So, so there's a bunch of toys here. I don't know what we're supposed to do next, but um, come look at the toys and definitely send us an email. I wanna hear, about all your success, because then I'll feel like I'm partially responsible for it. Thank you.